360 is where we gotta be We're at 387 CO2 parts per million now We need more renewable energy We gotta get more right now You're listening to KWMR at 90.5 FM in Point Ray Station and 89.9 FM in Bolinas And now at uh, 92.5 3 FM in the San Geronimo Valley and streaming live on kwmr.org. KWMR is underwritten by Anthony Moore Design Build, serving West Marin as a licensed building contractor for 23 years. More information about booking a consultation available by phone at 415-663-1105 or email at arm.design.build at gmail.com. KWMR is supported by Point Reyes Farmstead Cheese Company, offering handcrafted arson cheese, including... Toma and Point Reyes Original Blue, the farm's culinary and educational center, The Fork, offers farm-to-table culinary experiences and is available for events. More information at 800-591-6878 or online at pointreyescheese.com or The Fork at pointreyes.com. Welcome to Post Carbon Radio, where we explore the ways in which we can and must power down in a new era that is no longer exploiting our fellow humans and ecosystems. We believe in building up our community resilience, expecting economic collapse in the face of abrupt climate change, the end of cheap oil, the depletion of our natural resources, and a possible mass extinction on our planet. I'm Bing Gong, and our co-host today in the studio are Mary Breath Brangan and James Heddle of Bolinas and their co-directors of EON, the Ecological Option Network at EON3.org. You can find links to their blogs uh, and their extensive video reporting on our show notes uh, on our archive program, uh, which you can get to by... From by uh, uh, going to wmpostcarbon.com. They're currently at work on a forthcoming documentary entitled Shutdown, The California-Fukushima Connection. You can find more about that project online at shutdowndoc, that's doc.tv, that's shutdowndoc.tv. And today, in our nuclear news update, they're going to share with us some reports and interview bites from their ongoing video documentary production. Mary Beth and Jim, welcome to Post Carbon Radio. What have you got for us today? Thanks, Bing. Thanks, Bing. Hi. Well, today we want to share with listeners some of what we've learned in our recent taping trip to California's Diablo Canyon and San Onofre reactor communities and an update on citizen efforts to monitor the impact of ongoing Fukushima radioactive emissions on the U.S. West Coast. So we're connecting and supporting the people that are working to prevent our own Fukushimas from happening. And we also want to counter the lies from the nuclear industry and those confused by it, like James Hansen, for instance, that nuclear power is a solution for climate change. And there are many, many reasons why this is not so, uh, beginning with the fact that building a nuclear reactor and fabricating the nuclear fuel requires huge amounts of fossil fuels. And furthermore, the impossible task of sequestering the deadly resulting waste that uh, will be hazardous for 250,000 years is energy intensive to say the least as well and unspeakably energy intensive in even the first 20 years of grappling with how to deal with this so in San Luis Obispo uh, we recorded a nuclear regulatory commission community meeting on 
Pacific Gas and Electric's Diablo Canyon to there are two aging reactors there located at the intersection of 13 earthquake faults. And we met with uh, members of Mothers for Peace in San Luis Obispo who have actively been dealing with these reactors for over 30 years. And I I just want to start out with a story about uh, what happened at the uh, NRC meeting. One of the members of the Mothers for Peace, who happens to be a man, male members of the mothers (laughs) are um, plentiful, Uh, he testified at the NRC meeting that he'd begun measuring the radiation levels because he lived uh, in an area close to Diablo Canyon. And he had a good Geiger counter that was factory calibrated for accuracy. And the background radiation readings that he was getting, um, measuring day after day, were uh, ranging between 29 counts per minute and 41 counts per minute day after day. But then all of a sudden, one day, the Geiger counter measured 684 counts per minute. So at that NRC meeting we taped, uh, he asked Diablo Canyon's PG&E management if they had released any radioactivity on that day. And they said they didn't know, but that they'd research it and get back to them. That's always the response when you get them into a corner where they don't want to tell you what they really (laughs) need to tell you. Um, So... What people need to understand is nuclear reactors routinely release radioactivity in normal operations. They're allowed to, and then the utilities are allowed to self-report and to report only the averaged releases over a long period of time, like over a year. So residents aren't told when um, something that's called a batch release of radiation occurs, and that's disastrous for um, the residents that live close by. So uh, and it's especially a hard on the children. So afterwards, in Santa Barbara, we met with the director of the World Business Academy, whose name is Jerry Brown. Not the governor. This is a very different Jerry Brown. The World Business Academy has commissioned a recent study um, based on public health records of California, public health records, uh, that showed increased incidence of cancers and infant mortality in the zip codes um, closest to the Diablo Canyon nuclear reactors. And, of course, that took uh, uh, drew a lot of um, criticism from the industry and from um, other public health officials who thought that, who um, criticized it up one side and down the other. But it joins four European studies, one from France, one from Switzerland, Germany, and Great Britain, that also all showed increased childhood leukemia risk near uh, nuclear power plants. And I uh, did a bit more digging and found out that actually uh, increases in childhood leukemias have been found not just in Europe and around Diablo Canyon, but all over the world. There's actually a stunning total of over 60 studies worldwide which have examined child cancers near nuclear facilities, with most of them finding cancer increases. So then we continued down south to one of California's other continuing nuclear threats, San Onofre. Maybe listeners have seen the famous aerial photo uh, taken at San Onofre a few weeks ago during the wildfires in Southern California. The picture shows the San Onofre nuclear plant with massive amounts of smoke coming from a wildfire just half a mile from where over uh, 1,600 tons of the deadliest nuclear waste sits. The photo also shows bumper-to-bumper cars on Highway 5, which runs right along the nuclear plant, uh, of people trying to escape the wildfires. So imagine what could have happened 
if the fires weren't stopped and burned into the plant or caused a prolonged outage of the electrical power needed to keep the radioactive waste consistently cooled to prevent releases or forced an evacuation of the entire staff. In fact, there was a partial staff evacuation. So coming up here in our first preview clip here is Senator uh, Barbara Boxer grilling the NRC as to whether they will, as usual, grant the request of Southern California Edison, operator of San Onofre, to waive evacuation and safety plants now that the plant is in decommission mode. To the chairman, is this not your quote? When asked whether or not a shutdown plant could be dangerous, this is what you said. The fire could well spread to older spent fuel. The long-term land contamination consequences of such an event could be significantly worse than those from Chernobyl. Do you remember saying that or writing that? Is That's from the 2003 paper? Yes. Uh, it was a collaborative effort, that paper. Did you sign that statement? I am, I am one of the authors, that is correct. Thank you. And is it not true that the NRC said in 01, spent fuel fires could have health effects comparable to those of a severe reactor accident? Does anyone think that that's a misstatement by myself? Okay. My operator there for San Onofre submitted these many pages of exemption requests. Now, let me just tell you what they're asking for. This is what they're asking for. The operator is asking to discontinue off-site emergency planning activities and reduce the scope of on-site emergency planning. Examples of requirements subject to the proposed exemption that are related to discontinuing off-site emergency planning activities include, but are not limited to, requirements for off-site agency emergency plans, emergency planning zones, and ingestion pathway zones, the emergency operations facility, evacuation time estimates, off-site notification timeliness, off-site dose projections, Protective action recommendations, examples of requirements subject to the proposed exemption that are related to reducing the scope of on-site, on-site emergency planning activities. Now look, they're basically asking to be let off the hook, and they, if you grant this exemption, and you've never turned one down before, and you won't answer my question, none of you will, I'm going to show again the picture, I want Sam and Marky to see this, of how close a fire in California came to that decommissioned plant. Now, do any of you know how many hot fuel, spent fuel rods are in, in that plant? I do not have an exact number. I can take that for the record. If you anybody want. else know how many? Just for the record, 2,600. Do you know what it was designed for? The original design or yeah. after the yeah. re-racking had been done? If it was the original design yeah. and the open frame racks, probably about a quarter of that amount. 1,300. So this doesn't even go into other decommissioned plants. So anyone who says that a shutdown plant is not as dangerous has to just read what the chairman herself said, read what the NRC said, the consequences of an event could be significantly worse than those from Chernobyl. And i got to tell you, I represent those people, just like Senator Vitter represents his people and worries night and day about their safety from hurricanes and the rest. I worry about my people. And I'm not going to stop because I can't get any one of you to commit to me that you will turn down this request, this request for everything that they want to waive. And you've never turned it down before, and you won't answer the question. You do not know. Well, let me tell you, you better know, because I've got 8 million people that live within 50 miles of that site. I had a fire that came within half a mile of that site, and the operator had to evacuate the people inside. And now they don't want to have evacuation plans. This is a no-brainer. <clears throat> I'm sorry. You can sit there and say, 
We take it seriously? Really? Well, then let me just tell you. This facility sits on an earthquake zone, on a tsunami zone. You know what happens. You yourself wrote in a collaboration with other people that an accident here could be worse than Chernobyl. To me, there's an urgency. And to you, there should be an urgency. This isn't just any power plant. This is a nuclear power plant that has many of these spent fuel rods, okay? In an earthquake zone, a tsunami zone, and a fire came within half a mile. So I hope the staff will work overtime, just like my staff does when there's an emergency. So let me just tell you this. I am deeply troubled that commissioners haven't seen this. Commissioners, maybe they knew about the fire. If I were one of you, I certainly would have said, what's happening? This could have been, I don't even want to say, the type of disaster. All I have to do is quote the chairman in her 2003 paper in which she said, the fire could well spread to older spent fuel. The long-term land contamination consequences of such an event could be significantly worse than those from Chernobyl. Senator Vitter. That was Barbara Boxer. Uh, thank you, Barbara, for looking out for our interest. <laughs> uh, and what's next, Tim? Well, I just want to comment a little bit that there is an, uh, that's a little fragment is just part of the ongoing dispute between uh, the NRC and Barbara Boxer, who is demanding that they turn over records of the decision making process uh, that led to the installation of the faulty uh, steam generators. And they're claiming that it uh, they don't that they don't have to respond to her authority. That rather the separation of powers gives them privacy rights in this area. When in fact uh, the actual fact is that it's the Congress that created the NRC and which oversees it by plenary uh, powers. And so eventually. Let's hope they're going to have to turn over the decision-making processes. The reason that this is so important, uh, and I'm glad, as you are, that Sen Senator Boxer is pursuing it, there's more than uh, 116 million people live within 10 miles of America's aging nuclear power plants. That's more than one-third of the population of the United States. The operators of these aging nuclear reactors want to extend their working lives decades longer than originally envisioned. That means installing many new parts and pieces on all of them. And most importantly, uh, the NRC and the nuclear industry are treating uh, the decommissioning process at uh, San Onofre as the kind of model for what should go on at the rest of the country. I just want to conclude this segment with a brief quote from what Senator Boxer had to say. She said, The Fukushima near-term task force made up of NRC senior staff recommended the 12 measures to upgrade nuclear safety in the waste of the Fukushima meltdowns be, enacted, be put into place. As of today, the NRC has failed to require reactor operators to complete implementation of a single one of these post-Fukushima safety measures. This is unacceptable delay that puts the safety of the American people at risk. That's a, a quote from Senator Boxer. Now, yesterday, June 7th, was one, the one-year anniversary of the historic shutdown of the San Onofre nuclear power plant located on multiple earthquake faults in a tsunami zone and a fire, uh, wildfire zone, just like Fukushima, between Los Angeles and San Diego. The local activist community was still basking in the well-deserved glow of success at helping to force the shutdown when they discovered their job was not over. Research by retired IT expert Donna Gilmore and others revealed that over 1,600 tons of highly radioactive waste was still slated to be stored indefinitely in the San Onofre's vulnerable earthquake, tsunami, and wildfire zone. And that wasn't the worst of the problem, but that unknown to almost everyone, the waste was much more radioactive, thermally hot, than before. It's called high burn-up fuel. And it must be cooled longer in the fuel pools and is having problems uh, taking them out sooner, and it has to be in the long-term storage 
uh, in an even more challenging and dangerous way. So Donna Gilmore is the founder of the excellent and well-documented website sananofresafety.org, and in this upcoming clip she summarizes what her recent research has revealed. After the plant shut down, I thought we were home free after San Onofre shut down. And then I started researching the nuclear waste, and I found out we have a major problem here at San Onofre and actually in the whole country. Um, the waste is not being stored safely. Um, it's uh, stored in spent fuel pools that are very dangerous, require constant watering. They packed them really tight. So any safety mechanism they used to have aren't there anymore. They're using this zirconium cladding that even puts us at risk for a fire. And um, they're more vulnerable to terrorist attacks. So there's a lot of issues with the spent fuel. We're talking about moving it from the spent fuel pools into dry cask or dry canisters. Um, and the canisters they want to put them in are not, are not safe. Uh, there's a few, there's fuel called high burn up fuel. This is fuel that's that's they've allowed to burn longer in the reactor. It's uh, they they express it in terms of gigawatt days per ton of um, uranium. But basically, they've allowed them to increase the time the fuel burns in the reactor. Till now, it's up in this range, and and the higher this goes the higher the rate of this protect, protective cladding failure. And the NRC and the industry, they have no solution for this. So they're putting fuel in canisters um, that that could fail. Um, what does fail mean? Um, the, um, the, the cladding fails. Our, our first level of protection from radiation is gone. Our only other protection from the certain types of the radiation is in a canister, a canister that looks something like like this. This is a this is a canister, a stainless steel canister, a 5 8 inch stainless steel. This one holds 24 fuel assemblies. This is a picture of a enlarged picture of a fuel assembly. The cladding is a real real super thin layer of zirconium. Uh, all these rods, so these are all rods and they're filled with Pellets of uh, pellets of uranium, um, and then each one of these goes into one of those holes in the canister. The cladding. This is an, a picture of the cladding breaking down, and and if this breaks down. The radiation can get out of that first level. So if this canister fails, the the radiation will get out, and if we get oxygen in there, we could even have an, an explosion and have a major uh, radiation release. Um, they, they have what's called uh, damaged uh, fuel cans, which we're recommending. These are um, stainless steel cans that go around each fuel assembly, and then you put that into this bigger one. Um, our position is they should be used for all fuel because we do not know. Uh, we can't. There's no way to tell for sure that the cladding's failing or when it's going to fail, and we know with high burnup it can fail after it's in the dry canister. And being by the ocean, we have coastal corrosion issues. We can actually have cracking of this, th this thin canister. This is an example of stress corrosion cracking. We, so you can actually have cracks going through that uh, 5 8 inch uh, stainless steel. Regarding the coastal corrosion, if we, are to, if we were to have a leak from these cracks, or um, a lot of times the crack can come from the seal. If it's a bolted canister, that's where the weakest link is, and in a weld, in the weld in the canister, that's a weak link. If that is broken, and the and that inner cladding is gone, then we then have a major radiation explosion, and if oxygen gets to it, it can result in a hydrogen explosion, and then the radiation would go everywhere, like is happening at Fukushima right now. On, on, on that scale, except it'll be right here in the United States. And there's a, a document on the website, sadandofreesafety.org, that goes into uh, a detail about all the things they don't know, the monitoring we don't have to even know what's going on inside those canisters, and yet we're dealing with, with, with tons of, of radiation, um, much more than was at Chernobyl, um, much more that was in our atmospheric tents, uh, testing. So we could have um, 
millions of curries of cesium uh, in our environment. We could basically lose Southern California here, damage our food supply for the nation, um, damage our import-export cargo business here, which is 40% for the nation. Um, so th- th- this this problem here at San Onofre is good, will affect the whole world if, if, they, if we don't do this right. It's important that people get educated on this because even people in the nuclear industry, even people at the NRC don't understand details about this. There's been a lot of propaganda. Um, One of the things that we really need is we need a uh, a study on what the best technology is for for dry canisters because what if we leave it up to what's happening now with the NRC, um, um, we're we're not going to have a good solution. We're not going to have a safe solution. These canisters are going to be here on site at all the the reactors in the country for this probably 60 plus years. And so it's important for all of us to to deal with this issue because if we don't, nobody else is. And we're hoping to get funding uh, to hire an independent expert to make recommendations on the best canister designs and to have the, the lobbying and the legal power to make it happen. Okay. And for more information, um, you can check sananofreesafety.org. Uh, um, it's got it have more information and all all the information is cited with scientific and, and government uh, government documents. You're listening to KWMR Post Carbon Radio, community radio for West Marin, Point Ray Station and Bolinas, 90.5 FM Point Ray Station and 89.9 FM Bolinas. And now at 92.3 FM in the San Geronimo Valley. Plus, we are streaming live at kwmr.org. KWMR is supported by the Dance Palace Community Center, located at 5th and B Streets in Point Ray Station. Member-supported, the Dance Palace offers classes, events, and facility rentals for all the communities of West Marin. Membership information, volunteer opportunities, and schedules available at 415-663-1075 or online at dancepalace.org. We're continuing with our nuclear news update with uh, eons uh, ecology... uh, Ecological. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Options, Options no. Network with Mary Beth Brangan and uh, James Heddle. What else do you have for us today, Mary Beth and James? Well, we wanted to bring you uh, just a brief update of an issue we talked about when we were last on your program, and that is uh, what's going on at the WIP, the, the uh, Waste uh, Isolation Pilot Project in near Carlsbad, New Mexico. Um, there was both a fire and an explosion there, not just recently. Uh, actually, the explosion occurred on Valentine's Day. And subsequent investigation and, and uh, research by various agencies has, um, A, forced the closing, uh, the indefinite closing of the WIP plant, which was supposed to last for, uh, it was a demonstration project that was supposed to last for 10,000 years. It managed to get through the first 15 years without a major disaster. It may not reopen, but nobody knows at this point. So um, the explosion was caused by uh, a a number of factors, which all boil down to an erosion of the safety culture uh, in the nuclear industry across the country as well as uh, uh, an ignoring of uh, uh, local regulations and safety practice by the staff. Um, There was uh, the repackaging of the fuel um, procedure was changed uh, with the introduction of a kind of kitty litter that uh, created uh, an explosive situation in some of the drums. They don't know how many. One of them did blow up. 
down in the salt mine uh, half a mile below the surface of the New Mexico desert. Well, they're estimating uh, over 360, 368 or something like that now. Yeah, some of them were in in uh, shipping, in the process of being shipped there, and that has stopped temporarily for the moment. But uh, then they were going to ship it to Texas, where they were going to be temporarily stored in an open pit uh, in a in a county that has basically been taken over by the Harold Simmons Company Waste uh, Handling Specialists. We're waste Control Specialists. Waste Control Specialists. So if it can't be stored to a, a, a half a mile underground safely, it certainly can't be stored in uh, an open pit. Uh, over an aquifer, by o- the way. O- That's yeah, very o- important. Over the Aglala Aquifer, which lies uh, under uh, at least six states and is uh, the source of water for the food supply for the United States. This is a large subject, and we don't have time to go into it uh, exhaustively. But um, we d- have discovered in the process that there is a kind of a, uh, a shadowy agency called the, Na- the National Nuclear Security Administration, which is supposed to be um, subsumed by the DOE, but actually... Uh, essentially rules the roost and uh, they have been in the process of taking uh, used nuclear fuel from other uh, reactor sources around the world and bringing them to the United States to be reprocessed unfortunately none of the reprocessing uh, strategies have worked and so there's an increasing accumulation of high level uh, radioactive waste in the United States from other sources as well as our own uh, so uh, this is a, a serious issue, and uh, we'll report more on it in upcoming programs. Now I want to uh, turn it over to Bing to tell about some... Uh, uh, before we do that, Jim, uh, we forgot to play the PV clip oh. in the uh, Michael uh, Aguirre oh. Yeah, interview. see, I, I, yeah. I was... Mm-hmm. <laughs> could we... G- uh, could you introduce okay. PV again and uh, his outrageous remarks? <laughs> right. Well, the San Onofre case is the current epicenter of a controversy with implications for all of the 100 U.S. reactor communities. Um, and as we mentioned before, that means uh, implications for 116 million U.S. residents who live within the 10 miles of the reactor, one-third of the total U.S. population, and also the rest of us who are going to be affected if one of these um, problems completely blows, which is increasingly likely with the... Um, foolhardy chances that the industry is taking and and the lack of safety consciousness. They just don't care. Um, so one of the um, uh, recent California Public Utilities Com- um, Commission proceedings uh, recently was held on um, the issue of who was going to be paying what with the closed-down San Onofre plant. And uh, this clip that we're about to um, uh, hear is when Michael Aguirre, who is uh, a, a former San Diego uh, a t- a city attorney, uh, is questioning the owner of San Onofre, the president of Southern California, Edison, um, as to how this settlement had been uh, reached because the settlement was behind closed doors and uh, didn't include a discussion by everybody, did not include um, the uh, examination of the decision-making process that would have established whether the um, decisions were made sensibly or not and they came up with uh, the ratepayers should be paying 3.3 billion uh, dollars of the 4.7 billion that the decommissioning is going to cost so this is a, a, a clip of 
uh, what happened when um, attorney Michael Geary was pressing on those questions. And the remarks were made by the, uh, uh, by the press- California Public uh, Utilities Commission president. Uh, what's his first name? Michael, Michael, P- Michael, Michael P. P. V. So here it is. It's just a little short little sequence here. It's a ringtone, too. Okay. I'm not here to answer your goddamn questions. God. <laughs> we should have bleeped that. Yes. <laughs> Okay. This, so, uh, yeah, but this go, this go is this mm-hmm. is the kind of language. This is the kind of of uh, demeanor that uh, the president of our California Public Utilities Commission um, is using in in uh, proceedings. And I just cut it off because he also said, "Shut up, shut up." <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was he was definitely angered by um, Micah Geary's good cross examination of the. Um, the president of Senate of um, Southern California Edison, who operates and owns the majority of uh, San Onofre. So now here's a clip from um, Mike Aguirre, uh, who elicited that response from uh, Mike PV, the CPUC president, in that hearing. Here's a, an interview clip from an interview we did with him afterwards in his San Diego high rise. Uh, Okay, Office. here we go. I'm not here to answer your goddamn question. Uh, shut up. Oh. Shut up. <laughs> That's great. Kind of a bad ringtone on that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's very happy to be having an opportunity to talk with you today. I know it's taken me about a week to overcome <laughs> the emotional stress of Mr. Peavy's outrage. But uh, anyway, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Well, give us the state of play of this so-called investigation at the CPUC and what your objections are to the way it's being conducted. Well, the, the purpose of the proceeding is to figure out why the executives at Southern Cal Edison deployed steam generators that were supposed to last 20 years and only lasted two and related to that, why the ratepayers should then have to pay for the San Onofre power plant for the next 10 years, even though it's not going to be producing any electricity for them. That's really what the supposed purpose was of the investigation that was announced by the Public Utilities Commission in November of uh, 2012. And so what is the state of play currently at this date, uh, last of May 2014? Well, uh, the, there was a, a well-orchestrated plan to never have an investigation into who was responsible for uh, deploying the defective steam generators. Uh, there never was an honest effort to figure out whether it was reasonable to do that, uh, and there was no effort to figure out whether or, or an, an investigation into whether ratepayers should have to pay any more for the San Onofre plant. That that we now know. So that's that's one thing that's been established. But beyond that, uh, what has been established, there's nothing in the record that would allow the Public Utilities Commission to agree to the plan that's been put forward to end the investigation. Uh, based upon uh, the proposal that ratepayers pay another $3.3 billion. Uh, in order to get that uh, plan that was announced, the so-called settlement agreement approved, the proponents had to show that they went through the steps of evaluating the strength of the case that ratepayers had that they shouldn't have to pay anything more for San Onofre. And there has been an admission by the president of Southern Cal Edison, the primary proponent of the settlement, that there is no nothing in the record that would allow the commission to make a judgment in favor of the settlement agreement. What was the circumstance under which President Peavy had this outburst that led to this ringtone? Mr. Peavy got peeved and then melted down uh, after about 20 minutes of questioning of the uh, president of Southern Cal Edison, uh, who then admitted that there was no real basis for the settlement. And then when we turn to what the real 
reasons were behind what was being proposed by Southern Cal Edison. The president of Southern Cal Edison was asked, well, isn't it true that your the value of your stock went up $160,000 on the day, a few days after the settlement was announced? The ALJ, who works for Mr. Peavy, wouldn't permit it. And then I, I said, well, you know, we have an offer of proof. We want it, We believe that there never was an intent to have this investigation. It was a promise of an investigation without the intent to perform. We think that the ALJ uh, put off any investigation to the indefinite future, that she prohibited us from gathering any evidence about uh, whether the deployment of steam generators was uh, reasonable or not. And then uh, there were the secret uh, discussions aimed at figuring out how not ever to have the investigation. There was an announcement of the so-called settlement that was immediately joined in by uh, the uh, PUC president, PV, and by Florio, the assigned commissioner to this uh, issue, uh, claiming that they were happy that all of the uh, parties had settled, even though there were many that, that were not going along with the settlement. Are there implications of this, the outcome of this case that go beyond San Onofre and California even? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things that we have learned uh, from Fukushima and what's happening uh, in Japan right now is there is a covering up of the risks associated with these nuclear power plants. And we know in, in Japan there's been this change in government, much more conservative government, much more repressive government, uh, a tyrannical uh, threat, uh, but most importantly, a controlling of the information. And only what the government wants you to know is being disclosed. And there's probably a lot of different reasons for that, but you see somewhat of the same situation here in, in with San Onofre. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission has proven itself to be more of a cover-up artist or more of a cover-up operation than a disclosure operation. Same is true with the Public Utilities Commission. And the public has a right to know what the safety threats are, what the financial threats are, what the game plan is for redeploying the nuclear waste. And I think that that uh, part of what's happening here is sending out a warning signal to the other hundred or so nuclear power plant communities, the communities that are housing those plants, that you better take a look uh, at, number one, how is your nuclear waste being stored? How safe is it? What is the plan? You know, they have these burial, the, they call them the burial costs. Uh, and that's, you know, the, the cost of what they say are the nuclear waste that's going to be buried. But the question is, no one knows where the, anything's going to be buried. They don't even know how it's going to be buried. San Onofre would never have been on the radar screen had it not been for the failure of these steam generators. We never would have started to grapple with this because we would have just gone right ahead and, you know, not been aware of it. So the because of this accident or this failure of judgment, we're we're now in a wholly different situation. And we now are wait a second, this has been advanced. We are much more aware of, of the risks of, of, of getting rid of the nuclear waste. And all of the discussions, people like Donna Gilmore and others that are leading this effort all of the discussion that's being taken is taking place up to this point is the same people that were careless in deploying the steam generators are being just as careless in how they're going to store and, and transport and get rid of uh, the nuclear waste. And the problem with that is that that is a much more serious. It's not just about dollars and cents, but that is a personal safety issue. You know, maybe it's time to go to the community and get the groups that are really knowledgeable about. Uh, nuclear safety and nuclear uh, the cost of nuclear power and that are that are the, the, you know really dil have been diligent and, a, and a, well, a real dedicated record of diligence on this issue maybe it's time to put them in charge for a while you know and put the people that are the most concerned about the people and not most concerned about profiteering maybe it's time for that just for a change you know for the next few years and and you know even if they do the challenge is going to be great. You know, to figure this out is going to be really great. But, you know, if you don't try to figure it out, you're not going to figure it out. And at least you have to put people in there that are going to try to figure it out. We don't have that today.
I mean, it's kind of ironic. You had the the uh, pipeline blow up in San Bruno with PG&E. You had the San Onofre meltdown uh, with Southern Cal Edison. And then you had the firestorm with San Diego Gas and Electric. And all three of those problems, the Public Utilities Commission failed the public. And people are aware of that. It's, you know, San Bruno is very aggressive about it. And people... And, as they start to dig in, and the same with San Onofre, and same with San Diego with the with the fire, as people are digging in, they're finding out, hey, this isn't just about this one episode. This is a systemic problem. And California really is unique because it does have not only the highest prices, but its utilities are going up at about double what the national average is for as far as the, the costs and, and the amount that they're allowed to charge their returns on what they call their invested capital. You may not live in... Uh, the Southern California area, uh, or you might, you might, but this injustice is a systemic problem. And to the extent that you can pick up the phone and just call your local legislator and say, you know, I don't like the way the Public Utilities Commission president speaks to people that go before the commission and cusses them out and tells them to shut up. I, we really, that's that's really, you're, you're tolerating something that, that shouldn't really exist. That's not really the way in which we think, you are public servants. That doesn't sound like a public servant. That sounds like a, a tyrannical uh, public official. And we don't want that. And we want you to do something about it. We need that fellow to move on. And we need the, the message to go out, no, ratepayers shouldn't pay for the mistakes of Southern Cal Edison. And not only that, but you should pay the money back. And beyond that, the federal government should conduct, as Senator Boxer has asked, we need a criminal investigation of this. This is taking money from people under false pretenses. Why can't we go after people who are in positions of responsibility, who have no excuses except for their unbridled greed for doing this? Why can't we go after them? Those are the things that we need people to call up their elected officials and and just calmly uh, and rationally uh, get those points across. The thing people have to understand is they're supposed to, they, the public utility commissioners are supposed to be making decisions in the open so we can observe what's influencing their decisions. The decisions at the public utilities commission, you know, there's a, there must be some underground bunker that they all go to and make their decisions in secret because there is no way that when you look at the public record that you can understand how they go about making their decisions. And that is a constitutional state of California constitutional right that all Californians have to observe their public utilities commissioners making the decisions in their as a group. And that is being denied to them. The decisions are made behind closed doors in what they call ex-party meetings. Uh, the whole point about Mr. Peavy was asking him, hey, what, you know, you've been making decisions with Southern Cal Edison. Why don't you tell us how, how that worked? And that's when he said, I don't have to answer your question. I don't have to answer the question of whether I was meeting in secret with Southern California Edison plotting how not to investigate the unreasonable conduct of Southern California Edison's executives. I don't have to answer your question about how I was able to orchestrate this whole facade of a settlement. I don't have to answer your questions about uh, how much I've been involved in this whole process that you don't know about. Shut up. Just shut up. And, you know, that's the attitude that people have is the people of California from, you know, the Public Utilities Commission, colon, to the people of California, shut up. I don't have to answer your questions. And that's, right now, we don't have any politicians saying otherwise. We hope with the public hearing this and seeing this that maybe we can get some politicians to call up the Public Utilities Commission and maybe they can ask them. You've been listening to uh, Mike Laguerre, who represents low-income Edison rate player, uh, payers at, as an intervener at the California Public Utilities Commission. Now I'd like to uh, say a few words about uh, what we're doing here in Point Reyes to monitor the Fukushima ocean radiation, which uh, after three years, uh, the Fukushima disaster was March 11th, uh, 2011, and that ocean water that continually contaminated radioactive isotopes are going into the ocean, 300 to 400 tons of water every day, 
And now I understand uh, there's concern about strontium uh, getting into the uh, Pacific Ocean. So I was able to, uh, since there was no government agency stepping forward to monitor, we, the citizens, uh, had to do it, and I put out a plea for some funds to cover this uh, sampling just off of uh, Point Reyes. And what we do is uh, take a uh, five-gallon container of water sent to us from, by uh, Ken Bessler, who's a senior scientist at Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institute at, on Cape Cod. And then uh, we have... Tom Beatty, who's an Inverness fisherman, take the container out there and fill it with water, and then we ship it back to uh, Ken Bessler for analysis. Well, we've done two of those samples already, one at the first of the year and then just one in the first part of April, and there has been no uh, detection of cesium, uh, the fingerprint of Fukushima, uh, so far. And our next sample will be on um, around July 1, I believe, and uh, we'll see what happens then. And then the results will be posted to uh, the website called Radioactive Ocean, ourradioactiveocean.org. So stay tuned, and we'll keep you abreast. And we have a little clip here of Ken uh, Bessler, who was here in Sonoma giving a presentation on his work. And this is the... Uh, at uh, California's Bodega Head with a five-gallon can- uh, container. What is this, Ken? This is it. This is the kit. <laughs> so this is how we're going to collect the water. And this QB container, collapsible containers, holds about five gallons or 20 liters. And if you listen inside of it, something bouncing around, it's orange on the top is a temperature probe, and what we're trying to do is not only measure cesium in here, but look at the water properties and temperature, and we'll later analyze for salinity, salt content, are the two primary things that drive ocean currents and tell us where the water came from, so a combination of things, clipboard, funnel, bucket, and good to go. What we think we can do is make a Velcro strap. Uh, let's see. How about introducing our next clip, um, Mary Beth? Okay. Well, there there was symbolic significance uh, in the taking of the sample at Bodega Head um, because that is the location of a proposed nuclear reactor site that PG&E wanted to build a long time ago um, th- that was uh, discovered to be right on the... Um, San Andreas Fault. So uh, here's, and it was defeated by successful citizen research and organizing. So here's John Bertucci, who's the co-founder of Fukushima Response and organizer of the event that brought Ken Busler and Dan Scythe of International Medcom to speak in Petaluma last week. And John tells the story of what's now called the hole in the head. PG&E intended to build a nuclear power plant right here, a reactor. And uh, the big dream, uh, developers were already thinking there would be a freeway from here to San Francisco along the coast. Um, local activists got wind of the story. Now, the way it works is the same old story. They, get, they go through the courts, they get the permissions, they got a public relations branch, and they were steamrolling this through with politicians who were making decisions without really public comment. So the activists banded together and started a campaign to make that public comment. And some fortuitous things happened. There were uh, Malvina Reynolds, I don't know if you remember, Little Boxes, Little Boxes. Mm. She wrote a song against the reactor. Okay, mm. that, had, that got traction. Um, the editor of the Chronicle was on vacation, and the assistant editor got a big story in about the danger. Mm-hmm. So that got a lot of press. Uh, they did demonstrations here where they had balloons helium balloons with strontium written on it. They release them, they float south, they lose the helium and drop in your backyard and you read, you're holding strontium from the Bodega Bay power plant. (laughs) So the consciousness went, and this was early 60s, so there was a a sense of resistance. But the final blow was uh, 
UC geologist came out, climbed into the hole, said, you're on the San Andreas Fault. Bad idea. Yeah. And I believe at that point the A I the AEA backed out. Atomic Energy. Atomic AEC. Energy. AEC. AEC. AEC backed out. And PG&E said, washed their hands of it. Mm. So this so hole would have been the foundation of a... Foundation of a so we planet. would, Bodega Bay would have been a nice warm place to swim then, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that was one of the arguments. There was a lot of people who said, it's going to warm up the water and kill the fish. And yeah. We live yeah, on yeah. that fish. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess it was a case of citizen activists expressing concerns that delayed it long enough for consciousness to, to actually be able to pay attention to what yeah. issues might have actually happened. If something like that had happened in Japan, for instance, people might have, you know, put higher seawalls up at least or something like that. So after that inspiring story of a successful citizens campaign to close down a proposed nuclear plant, Here's another inspiring story. This one's from Japan. Um, citizens in Japan uh, filed a lawsuit that uh, resulted in a recent court victory, which is very unusual. Um, the court in the Fukui Prefecture ruled that the Ohai um, reactors would not be permitted to restart. And this is these are reactors west of Tokyo. Um, there, there have been um, massive public resistance to restarting the reactors, but the uh, current administration in Japan, of course, wants to go ahead and do that. And um, we, he said that even the judge said that even though this might be a short term. Um, consideration for the economy, the risk of losing their homeland would be far worse and would be the true disaster and was very impatient with the argument that this had to be done um, for economic reasons and that, look at, the, he said the uh, Fukushima disaster has been the worst uh, environmental catastrophe in their country, in, uh, in their country's history and that if the real disaster um, is when you can't use your land anymore. So we were very uh, edified and inspired by that result and that decision. And even though it'll be um, probably appealed and may even be overturned, it did set an important precedent. Because they want to restart all 50 reactors that are now out of service. That's right. Okay, well, I think we have to wrap that up. Uh, it's been a full hour show with a lot of reporting. Thank you, uh, Mary Beth Brangan and James Heddle of uh, EONS, uh, and all the wonderful work you're doing uh, oh. to keep us aware of what's happening uh, and Mary Beth and Jim will be back on uh, Post Carbon Radio next month for another nuclear news update uh, on the second Monday of July. So you can listen to this and other archive podcasts of our program on Post Carbon uh, on WMPostCarbon.com. Now stay tuned for Cruising with Rick Clark. Shut down Diablo.